What's up and welcome to episode four of the Chip Off the Old Block Podcast. I'm your host, CJ Matthews. And I'm the old block or the chip. No, I'm the old block. Wait a minute. Let me see. Chip off the old. Oh, I'm the old block. How y'all doing? I'm Dr. CJ Matthews and I'm uh, learning how to be the new person, uh, the old block. Thank you. Uh, forgive me for rambling. <laughs> Yeah, it ain't no mystery. It's so much going on right now, and there's so much to talk about. Um, we're actually in the process of getting our studio built and getting everything right. But with everything that's going on right now, we could not afford to not speak up. Not, now is definitely not the time to be silent. So we can get the studio right, we can get the look, and we can make it look pretty when it's time. But right now, somebody got to say um, something. Um, and I guess... Uh, we could start right here. Um, rest in peace to George Floyd. Uh, all of this has transpired since the last time we recorded, so we haven't um, had any uh, statement or any kind of uh, communication uh, since um, everything has uh, transpired. Matter of fact, last time that we recorded, we were just a couple of weeks removed from uh, the surfacing of the Ahmad Arbery uh situation. So uh I guess I, where I want to start is um this is really heavy. Um and it can really weigh down on you um not only as a black man but as a black father, as a black leader, um and as a black pastor who is responsible uh for s- who so many people look to for guidance and for direction um in a in a in a manner of different ways um and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest um just with everything that's been going on uh, i was feeling so heavy uh yesterday so burdened yesterday that i really just had to step away and i did something uh yesterday that i haven't done in over a year which was a normal part of my daily routine and that is i went for a run uh, i went for a, a two mile run and i just you know spent some time alone with me and god out in uh nature and it was it was a really uh It was a really good time and um, obviously, you know, everything hasn't changed, but it was one of the things that uh, was able to help me as my mental bandwidth had had reached its capacity. So the first question I want to know is, you know, given everything that's going on, just how do you feel? Right. Um, First of all, again, we want to um, to um, send our condolences to the Floyd family as well as the, uh, all the other families that have been afflicted within the last few months through uh, gun violence. Um, my, my immediate response uh, was anger. My challenge was the pandemic and how to go about participating in, in the protest and all of the things that's going on. Uh, then I came back to a deja vu because I've been here so many times. I remember holding meetings in our church in 1992 when Michael Pipkins was choked out by officers, and I won't call their names, who ultimately the coroner ruled that he died by asphyxiation, by the choke, by the strangle, but no charges were filed. Uh, One of the officers, the lead officer who actually did the choking, went on to serve another 20 years in, 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 the, in the police force. He didn't leave till 2013. Um, and we've been here so many times that we can't <clears throat> allow ourselves to become euphoric or distance. Um, so I've been processing so much uh, emotions, but more thoughts uh, than emotions. Um, I've learned over the years as a mature believer, how to be angry and uh, hopefully see it not, (laughs) hopefully, Uh, but how to process my anger and how to process that in a way that leads to something constructive, both for growth for myself, as well as things I will do forthcoming in the community. Yeah. um, Yeah, definitely. and really, I think that uh, over over the years, you know, um, I, I I I've been involved to a certain extent. 
I've gone to a lot of the the meetings. I've met with uh, government officials, public officials, obviously, as your guests. Um, and I've been a part of a lot of the conversation, a lot of the dialogue. And for the most part, you know, I, 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 I've, I've spent the past years uh, listening uh, and, and, and learning, um, just, you know, trying to, to figure out what is my role, what is my responsibility, um, you know, based on everything that's going on. And really, that's really where I've been um, lately. Uh, I've just been praying to God and seeking God. Like, God, what is my assignment? What is my responsibility? What is my role um, as a young black man, um, as a young black pastor, as a young black soon-to-be father? What is my role in moving us um, as a community and as a society um, forward? There's actually a, um, a group meeting and, and protesting tonight, uh, young pastors, some uh, city officials and things like that. And the uh, inspiring thing to me, um, I'm not, I actually have to talk, but uh, I'm not sure exactly this, if it was one individual or who all put it together, but is that um, first and foremost, um, this is something that will be um, saturated in prayer. Oh, absolutely. I and, think the the thing that so many people miss about the civil rights movement, that it, it was born in the church, it was anchored in prayer and, 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 and revelation, and um, the spiritual uh, power that embodied it, um, though often um, not spoken of, uh, was enormous. It was the whole, it was the movement. The movement was a spiritual movement. Uh, based upon what I'm seeing right now for the first time in a long time, we have that same spiritual energy seemingly vibrating throughout the nation. Um, and that's what it's going to take. It's going to take the spiritual energy to fight the wickedness of systems and people, systems that are put in place and people who don't understand or misunderstand or just are wicked and mean and evil. Uh, so the spiritual energy is important, and uh, Minister Kyle Early and Councilman Bashir Jones, uh, who are um, uh, leading that uh, protest this evening, I know both of them are men of faith, men of prayer, uh, men of great spiritual integrity. And so um, I know that uh, we're committed to praying for them and uh, believing God with them. I let them know that I actually can't come out right now, but... Um, that, that I will be um, undergirding them with what I can do now, and that is to do spiritual battle, spiritual warfare on their behalf. And for people who don't understand that, when you say you'll pray, they want to dismiss that because they don't understand spiritual warfare. They don't understand how to open the heavens on situations and circumstances. They don't know how to call down the power of God in a way that he begins to manifest himself as we're seeing right now. Uh, and I told someone the other day that the prayers of mothers uh, down through the centuries, and especially more recently, are being answered as people of good conscience now are having to say, wait a minute, I've been sitting on the sidelines and I heard one lady say, this has been going on for years. And then she said, no, 400 years. And she said, for her, that was enlightenment to even be able to make that statement. And so... When the power of God begins to crush evil, uh, it will manifest itself. And I think we're in a season, a unique season. And uh, even as you're searching and, and asking God, what is your assignment? I've always known my first assignment was to grow myself. Uh, we learned that from Dr. King's self-purification. Uh, if I don't grow in this, how can I expect someone else to grow? And then as I grow to share that with others by loving them, forgiving them, uh, joining in with those who are ready to create the change we need, both with effort, action, wisdom, and knowledge. Yeah. Um, and you, you just spoke to uh, the prayers of the mother. Um, I was listening to something, and there was a woman who was in uh, – there 
uh, during some of the demonstrations in uh, Minnesota. And she was actually from California. They said, what are you doing here? And she said that she heard him uh, cry out for his mother. (laughs) And that was like a call to her and not just her, but all mothers. So she said she was there because it was her responsibility as a mother to be there and to be praying, not just for her physical son, but for for her sons. And and I think that um, as we consider everything that's going on, one of the things um, that I'm praying for and that I'm, that I'm seeking is uh, healing because there is a level of pain. There is a level of trauma associated with everything that's going on um, to, to watch on video um, someone be murdered um, at the hands of law enforcement, not once, not twice, but over and over again, the level of trauma that comes with that, the level of trauma that comes with so many of the of that and the other things associated with just being black in America today, there is a level of healing um, that's needed. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we've been talking. I've been telling you about it. I'm not sure if you got a chance to check it out yet. There's been um, series um, on Instagram. Um, there's been battles like uh, MC battles, beat battles. But most recently, um, Sunday, a few days ago, um, there was a battle, and I think they called it the healing. Um, And in this case, uh, it was less of a battle and more just of a coming together. And the two people who were featured were Kirk Franklin and Fred Hammond. And it was I didn't get to see um, all of it because we were here doing some work, but I did get to, to peek in for a second and just the amount of people who were tuned in, um, it just speaks to uh, where we are as a people. But, you know, healing is something that is definitely necessary um, right now. And that was so powerful because uh, I'm a worshiper. Uh, you can't do spiritual warfare without worshiping. And uh, so in the midst of this, and I was thinking, uh, uh, Didi sent me the, the link, um, and I was thinking, I said, you know, maybe we need to bring together just uh, some of our worship people and just put out some worship right now because um, healing is important. And there there will come a point when healing can occur if it's facilitated appropriately. Um, and, and some of the singing I've heard in recent days in protests, whereas now we've turned away from those who were co-opting and looting and and doing violence, and now we're seeing more and more of the true protests uh, in various communities. Uh, unfortunately, it comes now that um, the National Guard and, 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 and police efforts are more intensified. Uh, we've got to give uh, some credit to many of the police officers who uh, know they have a duty, but they have been really, really trying to join in as much as they can and still fulfill their obligation uh, with the protesters, um, which has been very powerful. Uh, I lived through the Glenville riots and the Huff riots, and I remember those young National Guards uh, coming up in the Jeeps with those, and the guns seemed so big back then, and throwing those guns on us, and we weren't doing anything but coming home because they hadn't shut the schools down yet. I was... Uh, a football player uh, looking at colleges when the National Guard murdered those four kids at Kent State University. Um, And uh, um, again, they were not there to do that, but a reaction caused that. Um, And that's why when people come in and um, the potential for that kind of aggression exists, what we saw um, an officer um, uh, with uh, George Floyd was a modern day form of lynching. Uh, people wonder why we use that word, lynching. Um, <clears throat> because the thing about lynchings, lynchings were public, they were celebrated, men and women stood and watched. Um, these were not always done in silent or secret. 
And so what this man did, this officer Chauvin did, was he literally said, I'm blue, and because I'm blue, I can do what I want to do. Nobody's going to hold me accountable for my actions. Yeah, you got that camera on me. I might as well smile for the camera because we thought when cameras came into play, there would be some change. And we've seen on video officers killing people and no accountability. So he sat there with his knee on his neck while the other officer held him back, already handcuffed on the ground, begging for breath, calling for his mother, and ultimately transitioning to be with the Lord. So, again, lynching is real. Uh, <clears throat> Officer Chauvin demonstrated it in that way, but we see it in so many ways, and it is acceptable in this country. But what I'm seeing now, and I pray it's real, is I see people coming out, not necessarily saying they know what to do, but saying we got to do something. Yeah, absolutely. And you just touched on something that I want to get back to, but there's a question I have because not not before we get away from this uh, the topic or subject of healing, um, I guess, and it's something I was thinking about is my my question is, can there be true healing in the absence of justice? Great question, great question, great question, and the answer is no. And the reason why is because healing requires both time, the administering of the right medicine, and then the right person, surgeon, doctor, medical professional fulfilling their portion. And so it is important then that um, the justice that is needed comes as a part of the healing. It is the bomb. It is the salve. It is the bandage. It is the thing that is needed to create the kind of healing that is needed when a nation is in pain. And unfortunately, Mr. Floyd's death was the fulcrum for a nation to begin to express its pain from so many different things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, I think that it. Um, I, I agree that it, it goes hand in hand, and you know, um, and that's really why. That's really one of my prayers is because. You know, the, 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 the more this, there's there's something that I've been thinking about, and I didn't do any research on anything. It's just a thought, and I haven't got a chance to go back to it. But there's this idea or this concept known as the scales of justice, right? And <laughs> when you look at it, um, from my perspective, um, you know, the, the point of that scale is to balance, Right. But <laughs> this thing is off the hinge and it's not even close. But as it gets more and more and more and more out of balance, uh, unfortunately, the more and more difficult or the more and more ingrained uh, the, the hurt, the pain and the trauma is um, in, in, into our into us. Absolutely. The, and no one wants to have the hard discussions. Those scales don't represent us. Blacks aren't considered in those scales. Those scales are for the majority. Um, when it comes to us, uh, injustice reigns. Um, the criminal justice system has been critiqued over and over again and found wanting. Every study, everything. But yet you have legislatures who consistently um, write laws to create more opportunity for people to be in jail. Um, and so 
Uh, those skills don't apply to us, and if we think they do, unfortunately, we, we're we not aware of what it means to be black in this country. Um, I'll, go, I'll go to Drew Brees. A great quarterback, a great humanitarian, uh, and all that other stuff, whatever, but he is clueless. Clueless. When it comes to what it means to be oppressed in this country. Clueless. My father fought in World War I and Korea. What the heck does that have to do with what's going on right now? I had 10 family members who were career military people. At least 40 to 50, maybe 20, maybe I don't even know because my paternal side of my family, everybody went to the military. Two lost their life in Vietnam. What does that mean when it comes to racism? What the heck does a flag symbolize in a country that says we can kill you when we want to because we wear a badge. Thank God he apologized, and I'm sure he'll give some money. But it's that unawareness. If they had to truly listen to former quarterback Colin Kaepernick and all the African Americans who criticized him too, if they had to listen, we may not be here today. If they had a responded to the in the right way, and certainly the NFL has stepped up and given money and things to neighborhoods and communities, that's great. It's needed. Keep on doing it. But until we deal with the root cause of police brutality, and that is hatred, it is fear, it is a blanket immunity that says, I will not be held accountable. Chauvin never dreamed, never dreamed that that video would get his behind put in jail, have him charged with second-degree murder. And though that's good, until he is convicted and spending nearly the rest of his life in jail, what meaning does it have? Yeah, and I actually want to challenge something you said because uh, – when it comes to Drew Brees and people like him, uh, and it, it expands even to some of the more conservative pastors, um, it's a key phrase you use, and I think that that lets them off the hook. But because I don't believe that there's the lack of awareness, there there's not a lack of awareness. You, we all, the whole world, literally, they are marching across the world. The whole world just watched him with his knee on his neck. So um, there was no lack of awareness. Of course, he's going to come back a day later after everybody scolds him, after, every, after all of that sort of a thing. But, but there's no lack of awareness. Everybody knows exactly what's going on. And exactly what he said on that interview is exactly what he meant. There's a, lack of, there's a, a total lack of regard for what's going on. There's a total lack of regard for those people that you call your brothers that you make millions of dollars with. Once we come off that field and that wasn't a that what he didn't misspeak or anything like that. But he said exactly how not only he feels, but how nearly half of this country feels, because when, when you look at the popular vote um, in the last election, which a lot of people was mad because um, Hillary actually won the, the popular vote. But there was the elect, you know, we have the electoral college system. But if you look at the, at the popular vote, the numbers, the percentage in the difference of the vote was very small. Literally just about 50 percent of the country voted for Donald Trump It's just under 50. So nearly half of the country are willing to overlook those things because of something else. It's not a lack of seeing it, but it's just the willingness to overlook it. Yes, you're absolutely right. And here's the beauty. Um. Conscious is powerful. Uh, and what happens is, and Dr. Lowry used to use a statement, and Dr. King, the soul of America, redeeming the soul of America was a SCLC uh, theme for a few years. Um, and so when those of us who are aware and conscious and love humanity, um, when we stay silent, then evil can dominate um and and I've, I've, I've written a sermon dealing with conservative versus liberal 
It's in the name of those two philosophies that we're allowing our country to be destroyed. And American citizens have fall, fallen for it ignorantly um, and uh, have chosen that they would rather have these two competing philosophies and destroy our nation than to understand that neither one of them at any point is going to bring about the kind of nation that is going to facilitate our future. Um, unfortunately, while we are being divided and on the brink of civil war, um, other nations are rising, becoming stronger, becoming more united, and they're watching us in our folly, our foolishness, and our arrogance. And so that's why I'm excited today about what I'm seeing across this country with the young people, people of conscience of all colors and religions coming out and saying that we've got to bring about change. Uh, Chase Tuller, I don't know, and I don't mean to not say his name correctly, a young man in Cuyahoga Falls organized a march. And the business community just got so scared that the downtown business community boarded up the entire community because <laughs> they didn't know who was going to come out there. And one of the business persons, and I won't call any names, owned a business in Cleveland, and he got totally obliterated. And so he had to cancel it. But then Tuesday he went on to hold it, and I believe it was a Reverend Esom, uh prayed with him, and 150 of them showed up. And it was peaceful, and they prayed, they sang songs. But um, I saw a young lady at Kent State, and she organized a protest. And so these protests now are, have become a movement. And that's what some of the powers that be are afraid of, is that this movement will carry on for the next several months, and we will see some real change in this country. And if they can sustain it, I guarantee you we'll see change. You see, what happens is the media and our local media, thank God the national media is not doing that totally, but some of them are. Our local media will shift from the protest, the message, and the act that brought us here to the looting and the rioting. They will play that over and over again so that white people with good conscience will then move away from the message, move away from the act that got us here, and begin to focus on the looting and the rioting, and then go back into their places of comfort. That's why we need to call out local media and tell them to stay on message. This is bigger than looting. This is bigger than rioting. Whoever is doing it, those are opportunists that have no place in what's going on. But at the end of the day, even rioting, even looting, when it comes to the United States of America, we are the best at it. We are the best rioters. We are the best looters. And if you don't believe me, ask me about the American Revolution. If you don't believe me, ask me about Black Wall Street. If you don't believe me, look at our history books, not the redacted stuff they tried to teach us, but the things we know are true. So when it comes to rioting and looting, we are the best on the planet. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that it points out is just that property is more important than people. Money is more important than um, everything else. Um, and really there's a, there's a, that's something that you spoke to earlier um, about the officer, Chauvin, Chauvin, whatever, how he just knew that he had the authority. Um, and there's a quote that says, power corrupts and absolute um, power corrupts. Absolutely. And we know that we have a corrupt system, but to your point, basically what's happened is law enforcement has reached a place where they have literally been given absolute power. Right. Unfortunately, we talk about good cops and bad cops. It's the wrong conversation because immediately that puts people on the defensive. Wrong conversation. 
We're not talking about good cops and bad cops. We're talking about human beings with flaws. And when they make a mistake, they should be held accountable. When they murder somebody, they should be held accountable. When they go to the wrong house and kill people, they should be held accountable. When they pull up to a play- playground with a kid with a gun in his hand and within seconds kill him, they should be held accountable. There is no way on earth that you can tell me if a person in the military who serves in the military comes home and shoots somebody, they're not going to jail. But they put their life in, in, in harm's way every day. Firemen put their life in harm's way every day. But if they shoot somebody, they're going to jail. Why is it that this select group of people, out of, if a medical doctor does something wrong, they will either be sued civilly or they can actually be charged and criminally? All right? Why is it that this one group of people, all right, has blanket immunity because their job is to police blacks, browns, underclass, poor, and protect the rest of this country from us? Absolutely. It's whose interest um, are they supposed to pro? Tech and, 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 and really what it what it speaks to is is not a broken system, but it's a system that is doing exactly what it was designed um, to do. And this has really been my issue. Police brutality, but even uh, beyond that, um, you spoke to the American Revolution. Um, my I've always been torn is because. Over the years, we've made a lot of progress. You know, if, if you consider the fact that we were that our people, our ancestors were literally physically enslaved. Um, you know, a, a, a lot of things have happened since that. But my confliction lies in this question is, can this system be fixed? There's a part of me that doesn't believe that this system can be fixed but in all actuality there has to be a new system um to be put um in place we all know that you can't build a house on a broken foundation and literally the foundation of this country the documents the ideas and the beliefs that are well at the foundation at the core of our nation were put into the were put in place by people who owned other people and I don't even need to get past that point um, to justify what I'm saying. Yeah, Dr. King, um, in his book, Chaos or Community, Where Do We Go From Here, um, said something. Uh, unfortunately, phase one is what he called it. Um, and that was for white people to, to actually begin to treat people with decency. All right, let's take away the last, slash, lash. All right, let's take away the, 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 the brutality, okay? Let, let's, let's treat them with decency. But equality, now that's a whole nother discussion. And ultimately led to his death when he began to talk about economics and focusing on economics. People think it was Vietnam when he spoke out against Vietnam. No, no, no. It was when he began the Poor People's Campaign and he had the kind of a... Uh, uh, authority with the people's minds and hearts to speak to their conscience and therefore to redeem the soul of America. So it doesn't matter who you're praying to today, and especially those of us who call ourselves Christians. Um, right now, the soul of America is on its way to hell. Uh, it's probably been on its way to hell for a long time. So it doesn't matter the size of your church, how big or bad you think you are as a preacher and an anointed person. The soul of America is on its way to hell. What's the body of Christ going to do? Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. And I, I think it's just that, not just that, but, you know, the system is, you know how there's like um, sometimes on one of your devices, uh, you may not have updated for a long time, and then at one point 
it won't work no more. And it says system update required. It's like you can't move forward until the system is updated. But we are literally in a place and we have been for a long time where a system update is literally required. Um, you know, and the, the, the thing that makes it a little more difficult in my mind is that for certain people, when you walk around every day and you look around, there are good white people <laughs> and people are cordial. People treat each other decent. You have black people in powers of position. You have black people who have achieved um, and are building wealth. And a lot of people can look at that and be like, wow, you know, things are actually not that bad. But when you look at it, and I was listening to the other America um, just on yesterday, <laughs> there still exists another America. And we literally are living in a system that is antiquated. And I want to give an example um, as a metaphor. Um, it came to my attention. I, I listened to different things. And um, you know that how the music industry works. And the music industry is one of the most predatory industries that there is. And they literally rob, they literally loot <laughs> and rob us on a daily um, basis. They co-opt our culture and they gain off of it. But here's one of the things that it is. Um, still to this day in 2020, um, in a day where everybody listens to music through a streaming device where... Um, Nobody is rushing to the store to buy a CD. Most artists aren't even having CDs pressed, right? Still to this day, there is language that exists in music contracts where they have to pay um, for breakage. Because back when they would press up CDs, albums, there was the opportunity for that product to be destroyed. So the burden was placed on the artist to pay a portion out of the, you know, the things that were destroyed. But that type of a thing still exists in a contract in 2020. And we're living in a world where we're living on contracts, <laughs> legislation that does not even come close to the conscious and the heart of the majority of the people. And when that's true, a system update is required. Right. Absolutely. Um, and now that brings me to a, uh, point that so many people don't like to hear. Um, we don't get a system update without voting and census. Um, those are two opportunities for system updates that the majority community participates in very well. Um, and some people don't see the benefit because of all the stuff going on. Well, it's one wrong on the ladder. It is not the ladder, but it's a necessary wrong. Um, because when we don't vote, we, we place ourselves in a position where the statisticians know exactly how many black people are going to vote. So therefore, they know how many resources they're going to allo allocate toward that particular market. They know that what they can do to co-op, I mean, it's a science for them, all right? I guarantee you, over the next 10 years, if we were to begin to register 1% to 2% more people in every precinct in the black communities across this country, you would begin to gain more political clout. Not power, but clout, meaning that your voice would have to be heard differently. If we became aware of those legislative districts that make the biggest difference for us, we would participate in the census because I would much rather have Marsha Fudge than a right-wing conservative determining my outcomes. So those two things are two things. The other thing is... Revolution. <laughs> Every country does it but us. And we've never, we haven't done it in years because of stable government. But our government is so unstable now, that may be the way to go. It's revolution. Uh, people don't like to hear that word uh, because it automatically means that we're going to destroy something. No. We're going to have a revolution in November. All right? Okay, I don't like Republicans or Democrats by party, I like people. So I got, I know people who are both parties. But right now, because the conservative party, the Republicans have chosen to keep their foot on our neck by restricting voting, trying to take away voting, 
stacking the Supreme Court with crazy people who will never rule in the favor of a minority on anything, all right? Since they've chosen to do those things, then if we want revolution, at least for a small period of time, we need to give the, the House, the Senate, and the White House to the Democrats. I never thought I'd hear myself say that, okay? But that's one of the things we need to do because that would create a counter-revolution to what's been happening in the last four years. The last four years has been a, a total, just a total revolt against everything that President Barack Obama did. Everything. Good white pastors, good white Christians in revolt against Obama literally chose a person of no moral character to represent them, the evangelical church. So unfortunately, I believe that revolution is necessary, and if, we can't, if we're not going to have a revolution, at least let's give, um, and I don't believe I'm saying this again, let's give uh, Biden and his people an opportunity to, uh, and he needs the Congress and he needs the Senate, or else he'll be in, in a gridlock just like they did to Obama. Uh, so we need to give him both of those and then hold him accountable. Uh, we need to lift up that Bloomberg plan again. I know Representative um, Clyde Byrne has a plan. Uh, I've heard it, and it's good. He understands it. He's a great man. But we need to lift up that Bloomberg plan. See, the difference between now and the civil rights movement, King had a clear philosophy, a clear vision. He was able to articulate it. And a lot of people bought into it, all right? And policy changed. That's revolutionary. Voting Rights Act, all right? Policy changed. Until we can change policy, like you just talked about those contracts, there'll be no revolution. There'll be no reset. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to that point, I think certain things do need to be destroyed. There are certain entities there are certain uh things within the system that need to be destroyed uh in order to give birth to um something new and somebody had an interesting uh response to everything that's going on and i I'm, i don't know if i'm not sure what your response would be but um bob johnson uh founder of bet um one of the things that he that he said was he said now is the time for America to go big, and he said the way that America can go big is by offering reparations. And a lot of people hear that word like reparations. No, we don't want no handout. But the point that he makes, which is true, is about the transfer of wealth. He says a wealth transfer is literally like slavery. Slavery created probably the largest transfer of wealth in 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 the history of uh, of this country if 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 they really want to do the right thing then wealth transfer um the more opportunity for economic empower, empowerment that is the biggest play that can be made oh absolutely and it's not see what they just did it all right yeah, exactly. Several, with the with the stimulus, several million Americans woke up and got twelve, twenty four, whatever you got. All right. So and they've done it. They they do it in ways that's unbelievable. They build out banks. They build out savings and loan institutions. They build out auto industries. They give welfare to everybody. All right, all right. They just don't describe it as that. All right. Reparations is a concept, but it has to have a vehicle and a plan. All right. You've got communities where children live in houses, unfortunately, that are not enhancing their education, all right? Habitat Humanity has proven you put a kid in a better home, everything changes for them, including their academic potential. We live in a city, a uh, city of Cleveland, all right, Cuyahoga County. Our county exec just did a big faux pas, wanted to give $30 million dollars to majority companies and uh, thank God for the uh, African American uh, county council members because they said no and he had to capitulate but that goes on all the time 
we could take several businesses that have the potential to grow, and over the next 10 years, see, everybody wants instant. The, the, the stimulus check was great, all right? Over the next 10 years, grow those businesses through county and city contracts so that you begin to have businesses, minority businesses, that are capable of hiring people who look like them. We know that's the answer, okay? All right? And these contracts, billions of dollars are going to be spent in the next decade on contracts. Majority contractors, unfortunately, believe that any dollar that doesn't come that way is, is a dollar taken from one of their brothers. We don't have enough to feed ourselves. Shut up. All right? You've had privilege all your life. There's a way to do reparations, and we may have to call it something different for this country to embrace it, but there's a way to give stimulus to the African-American community. Uh, Bill Clinton had empowerment zones. Uh, uh, the current president has some kind of zones. I haven't seen any results from him, but he's got some kind of zones. There's a way to get it done, but it takes political will, not political rhetoric. And we're going to get the rhetoric right now from everybody. Right now, everybody's uh, creating policies and writing letters and talking about we need to do. There's some concrete things we can do right now and put some things in place right now to begin the next decade so that over the next decade we begin to impact poverty and affect black lives that matter. Yeah. yeah, you hit the nail right on, on the right on the head. Um, there was something that uh that that I that I saw um over this week, and you know my my take on it might be a little off, but it it, it, it bothered me. Um, <laughs> and this is what happened. So, it because it brought a whole other set of thoughts to my mind. But basically, what happened is so. Um, we bought this uh, baby sign for the room. It's a little sign, got the baby's name on it. Bought it, it came, it looks great, it's amazing. Now the whole country and the whole world, there's unrest, right? And everybody, here's what's going on, and this is what happened. And it, 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 this just came to my attention. So the company that we bought it from, I don't even know what they call it, but uh, I literally went through their whole feed, their, their whole, the whole history of their Instagram. I looked. I scrolled the whole thing to look at every single pic picture. And this company started in 2015, right? And literally, not until this week, there has not been one black baby posted. But now, in the midst of everything that's going on, um, they've made two posts with featuring black children. And to me, that is not a step in the right direction, but... It, it 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 just showed, and maybe maybe what it shows, maybe maybe if I step away from my feelings, what it shows is just like you just don't get it. But to me, that's racism. Absolutely. Well, see again, you know, when you talk about a reset, you know, I had an iPhone three for all those years, and I wasn't <laughs> gonna get no new phone because I don't believe in buying stuff over and over again. And then uh, all of a sudden, nothing would work. And my fitness app wouldn't work, and I needed it. And it was like, oh, man, now I got to go buy a phone. And so just so y'all know, I got an iPhone 7 Plus, and I'll have this for the next 20 years. But because um, <laughs> uh, I don't believe in that. That's why I'm the old block, all right? But um, uh, see, that company there needs competition, all right? So uh, some Instagram or tech-savvy African Americans need to start that company. They don't have to beg white people to post black babies. Yeah, and it, it is the point, and one hundred percent that that is the response. But the point to me is like, matter of fact, I'm gonna start that company when we finish this podcast. Y'all just gotta tell me what to do. We can buy the stuff. I did that in the seventies. You know, a Caucasian man was taking advantage of some of my friends. I organized them. We bought the company and we took it over. Yeah, and it's not it's not begging anybody to do anything, <laughs> but it's when you use. This as a platform for marketing, that, that creates the problem for me. Yeah, Whereas on, on another, because on another hand, then you have a Nike, right? And Nike is in a, 
mm, if I do, if I don't. Because on one hand, if they don't say nothing, oh, you, oh, you got all these black people buying all your shoes. But then if they do say something, it's like, this ain't nothing but a marketing campaign. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you have to look at the history and follow the money. Uh, you have to look at the history and, 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 and see the philanthropy and the wealth. Um, I, I've never been angry about people building wealth. All right? That's just not been my reason for targeting. Okay? Um, my challenge has been, how come as African Americans we can't create more of an economic base for ourselves? Uh, people just don't give you their money. All right? That's the bottom line. Uh, and if we set up a system where we begin to rebuild our neighborhoods ourselves, they don't want to come in our neighborhoods know how. The only time they come in is to take our money away. Um, we have to create an economic base. We did great to create black politics, but we never created enough black wealth and black economics here in the city of Cleveland. Um, thank God for that there are so many wealthy black people today through business, entertainment, sports, and so on and so forth. So, yes, things are better um, in that sense. But that does not take away from the fact that right now the soul of America is going to hell. And the protesters are your redemption. The protesters are your savior. The protesters are your Messiah, whether you want to hear it or not. All right? All y'all say y'all love Jesus. And look at the hell you allowed this country to go through. No, 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 no. I don't think y'all love Jesus. No, 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 no. Figure it out. America's soul is on its way to hell, and the protesters are your redemption. Yeah. Um, and that's what I was just talking to. Uh, I was just talking to somebody about I was just on the phone uh, with Kimberly and Didi earlier this day. And <laughs> I'm sure, I, I, for the most part, and maybe I'm wrong for this, over the past, what, four years, I've done, I've tuned out Donald Trump for the most part. Um, I stay aware and I listen to what's going on. But for the most part, like, I don't give him any attention. I, I don't, I just don't. But uh, his most recent stunt with the whole Bible with them spraying those protesters to get a, uh, for to clear the way for him to go take that picture, which has <laughs> certain iconography attached to it. But my question, what, what this led me to was, I wonder what the excuse going to be this time. Those same people who have witnessed him for the past four years, those people who love Jesus, who have demonstrations, who have rallies, who have uh, uh, conferences speaking about uh, the right to life. What's going to be their excuse for supporting Donald Trump this time? Well, the philosophy. Conservative, Republican, liberal, Democrat. Um, those competing philosophies are so ingrained in people's spirits, which is why I never bought in either one of them. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, they're both detrimental, and neither one of them represent God, Christ, or Jesus, or, or, or the spirituality that I affirm in my life, which is why. And my Caucasian Republican friends know that, my uh, Caucasian and African American uh, Democratic friends know that they know. I don't care for neither one of them. Now right. I care for people, and so that's why I've always worked across the aisle and work with Republicans, work with Democrats, because I care for people and I want to serve my community. But as far as buying into those philosophies, they're all anti-God, and people will say, "But they're the closest to closest to what? You don't get close to God. Either you are, or you're not." And that's why I've never held elected officials in the esteem that I would hold a priest or a prophet because we all fall short. So there's no way I can judge them according to a biblical standard, okay? I judge them according to their politics. How do they feel about human beings? And if they do right by human beings, then hallelujah. If they don't do right by, by human beings, I can't vote for them. Not abortion. Not in the womb only or out of the womb only. All right? No. It's about how do you treat human beings. And when I see people treat human beings horribly, 
I love them. I pray for them. I'm willing to forgive them. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't vote for them if they were the only candidate. Yeah. Um, I'd just be interested to hear. Uh, well, maybe the next show, we um, probably need to wrap it up today. But, you know, I'm old. Uh, I don't think I'm tired. Am I tired? I don't know. But anyway. Oh, I shouldn't say that. Okay. Edit that out. Edit out. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> See, I said, okay, let me say this to the audience. The good thing about being me is I don't know none of the stuff y'all are supposed to do on these things. I've been me for 66 years. I do what I do. I don't care who like. I mean, I should care. Okay. It's just out there in the public. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. We got a good team here. I'm thankful. But maybe we'll deal with this presidential election in our next cast. I can't say that because with everything going on, uh, we can put that down as one of them. But I've been dealing with the Antichrist on Wednesday nights and uh, the manifestation of Antichrist. So uh, it's a lot we can talk about. But uh, the old block is tired. Well, with that said, I guess uh, it's time to sign off. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's good. Uh, thank thank uh, everybody for tuning in uh, to another episode of Chip Off the Old Block Podcast. I don't have anything else, but um, maybe this time we should do something a little bit different. You want to pray us out? Yes, I do. Um, and we're talking to Pastor Maiden and several of us um, looking at some ways to gather for prayer um, and uh, uh, some times to gather for prayer. We, we both do uh, live noonday pr uh, prayer calls. And uh, right now, uh, one of the things that can help redeem the soul of America is prayer. If my people, which are called by my name, will seek my face, humble themselves and pray, turn from racism, wicked ways, poverty, wicked ways, then I will hear them and heal the land. Father, we just honor you today, and I thank you so much. I rejoice in being able to sit with my son and share and to have an audience, Lord, who is willing to listen. Um, I pray, God, that as we share that um, our hearts would be open and our minds would be open to you. I pray, God, for the Floyd family as they begin to celebrate his life through memorial services today and over the next several days. I pray for all of those who've lost their lives unnecessarily at the hands of people, Lord, who were put in place to protect and serve them. And then for those who have determined that they are the justice of their communities and are willing to kill people, Lord, in the name of law enforcement, even though they have no authority, I bless those people families, Lord, also. Now, God, open our hearts and our minds to this current move, movement. Protect the protesters, Lord. Keep them safe from the pandemic, from the perpetrators, from the wickedness in, of our government. Just protect them, Lord. And now, God, unite the hearts of the righteous from every ethnicity to bring the soul of America out of the bowels of hell, into a just world. Thank you again for my son and my family. Bless, Lord, all who are associated with this ministry, with this podcast. Thank you for our listening audience. Bless them now, I pray. Give them the spirit of prosperity, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.